Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, can we just go around the room and hear from our get uh, our um, um, audience members? I should say before we start officially. Um, uh, very quickly, Calvin, tell us a few words about who you are. Um, I'm Calvin Mao, um, and. I have think of I think I've been associated with you guys now for a few years, um, and I write a blog occasionally on your website. We're very lucky to have you, Calvin. Thank you, Anna. Can you unmute yourself? Maybe we'll not. come back. Huh? Maybe. We'll come back to Anna in a minute. Alina, can you say a few words for us? Uh, hi guys, <clears throat> I'm um, I'm back in Bucharest, so it's uh, rather late for me, but it's great to be with you and to to listen to what you have to say because that's a theme that I've been interested in lately. And um, yeah, well, um, as some of you know, I work as a um, as a consultant, as a strategy consultant for NGOs as well as um, brand, commercial brands and other institutions. And I've been working with the Romanian diaspora for a while, uh, which is one of the reasons this is uh, interesting and important for me. And I'm also going to be in uh, this week in uh, what is the largest gathering of the Romanian diaspora in Bucharest. It's the um, it's two events actually organized by Repatriot, that's a Romanian NGO. Uh, it's the top 100 Romanians abroad and the uh, Repatriot Summit in the mountains, which is the nice part. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll be talking about um, these issues as well. So this is uh, why I'm interested to, to see what's, uh, what's going on with you and what's the news on this front. Thank you, So Elena. thank you. Thank you and welcome. How about you, Mac? Welcome. Can you say a few words? Well, we'll come back to Mac and to Anna in a, in a minute. Uh, but before we go in, oh, we're saying we're hearing from Mac in the chat. Um, uh, thank you for saying hi. Uh, we're going to hear from our speakers today, but before we do that, let me introduce this panel. The purpose of the panel today is to provide a comprehensive, fairly comprehensive guide as much as the time allows us, right, to navigating the multifaceted challenges that immigra immigrants face. Immigration, as we all know, is a complex and often overwhelming process, touching multiple aspects of an individual's life. Through this session today, we aim to address these challenges from three key perspectives, legal, psychological, and cultural. The immigration process is filled with technicalities from understanding visa categories to meeting application requirements and navigating policy change. Many people find themselves confused or anxious about the steps involved in obtaining legal status, residency, or citizenship. So we'll try to demystify some of the legal processes and offer some insights into common pitfalls to avoid. Immigration can also be an emotionally taxing experience. The process often involves leaving behind family, friends, and a familiar environment, which can lead to stress, anxiety, identity crisis, and even depression. Moving to a new country involves adapting to a new culture, language, way of life, which can create a sense of disorientation or even alienation. Many immigrants struggle to find balance between their cultural heritage and the expectations of their new environment. So with this webinar, we're trying to build this awareness. Ultimately, the goal of this webinar is to equip attendees with the knowledge, resources, and tools they need to start navigating these critical areas successfully. Whether you're an immigrant yourself or someone working to support immigrants, the session will start to deepen your understanding of the immigration journey 
and to provide actionable advice for overcoming the hurdles in this path. My name is Roxana Kazan, and I am the Executive Director of Archer, American Romanian Coalition for Human and Equal Rights, and I will be your host today. The structure of today's webinar is designed to guide you through the complex journey of immigration, addressing it from three essential angles, as I said before, legal, psychological, and cultural. We've organized the session into three segments, each led by an expert in their respective field. We're going to begin with the legal perspective, where our immigration attorney, Dana Bucin, will provide insights into uh, some of the processes tied to the immigration process and the legal challenges immigrants face. Next, we'll transition to the psychology, psychological aspect with Mihaela Campion, who will discuss the emotional and mental health impacts of undocumented immigration. And in the third segment, Juana Amaria will draw, dive into cultural competence, exploring how immigrants can balance integrating into a new culture while maintaining their own identity. And finally, we're going to bring all the speakers together for a panel discussion where we're going to try to connect the dots between the legal, psychological, and cultural aspects of immigration, and we're going to open this up for Q&A. As uh, we're going to start with uh, listening and hearing from each of our uh, speakers, um, I will um, introduce, uh, ask them to introduce themselves, actually, and I will encourage you all to um, visit Ar Archer's social media uh pages and to read uh about each of our speakers bios posted there all right so i've been admitting uh some other uh participants thank you dana and thank you ella for joining uh if you have a moment and you didn't have a chance to introduce yourselves i highly encourage you to introduce yourselves in the chat so that we know who you are and what brought you here to this webinar today but i'd like to get us started and I'm going to um, uh, ask Dana Bucin, uh, hello, Dana, and thank you so much for joining us today. Will you please tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and why is the topic of immigration near and dear to your heart? Thank you, Roxana, and thank you, Archer, American Romanian uh, uh, Coalition for Human and Equal Rights, for hosting this webinar. I have always been fond of Archer's mission, and uh, my inclination to practice immigration law has a lot to do with my inclination for defending human and equal rights. I perceive immigrant rights to be human rights, of course, um, and uh, so that's my interest in being an immigration attorney. That is the perspective from which I have entered the profession. I have been an immigration practitioner for the past 20 years. I am originally from Romania, of course, and um, proudly representing Romanian immigrants as well as immigrants from around the world in their uh, dream of coming to America and succeeding, not just surviving, but thriving in America. Um, if you want me to, I could go ahead and start uh, sharing my slides so I could give uh, the audience a flavor for what is out there in terms of visa options from a legal perspective. So if that's okay with you, Roxanne, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you, can you see my screen now? Can you see? Yes, can you, we can see your screen. Wonderful. Let's see. All right. And can you see me scrolling down the slides? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So having tested the system, I am ready to go. All right. Um, hold on. Just making sure that I'm enlarging it for your personal use. All right, there it is. Okay. So a little bit about my profile. Um, you could see that I am originally from Romania, that I went to law school here in the United States at Boston uh, University School of Law. One of the achievements that I'm most proud is assisting Ukrainian refugees uh, by bringing them to Connecticut under the Connecticut for Ukraine Refugee Matching Program. Um, then I want to dwell right into 
immigration 101. So there are some categories of immigration law that uh, one has to come under. There's very rarely such a thing as immigrating by yourself you have to have a business or employment relationship with a U.S. company in order to get a work visa, or you have to have a family relationship with a U.S. citizen or permanent resident in order to immigrate. And then there's the humanitarian avenue of immigration uh, for asylum seekers or refugees, for example, there's also the diversity visa lottery, and I want the audience to know that the season is coming up in October. Uh, at the beginning of October, this uh, lottery opens up and awards close to 50,000 free green cards per year to people from around the world, including Romania, and especially Romania. Um, is Romania is one of the countries that's eligible for it because the purpose of this program is to attract immigrants from countries that do not send us too many immigrants as a way of diversifying the pool of folks that we welcome to the United States. So I encourage anyone who might desire to immigrate to the United States and they're from a country that's eligible to go to the state.gov. Um, so the US Department of State's diversity visa lottery and enter for free, not for any type of fee, um, in for a chance to earn a green card. The the lottery will run early October to early November each year. Then there are lesser known ways of gaining immigration in the United States, such as VAWA, Violence Against Women Act, and a bunch of other categories that we won't be spending too much time talking about because they're not as typical. Here is what Here's what is typical. So this is a typical path to US citizenship. Someone comes here on a, let's say, non-immigrant visa, a student visa, which is the F1. During the F1 student visa, they may exercise curricular practical training, CPT, work permit while in school, or optional practical training, OPT permit after graduation. So F1 visa comes with these privileges of working uh, during and after student status. At some point, one migrates to the H-1B work visa, which is the most typical one. And after a few years, they may attract sponsorship through employment-based employment -based sponsorship, or they may be petitioned by a family member for permanent residence, also known as green card. Once they become green card holders in three to five years later, they become eligible for citizenship for naturalization. Three years if they've been married to a US citizen and that's how they got their green card, or five years if they've been uh, getting their green card for employment-based. Unfortunately, uh, we do have a large population of undocumented folks and we'll talk about the reasons or what what the causes of undocumented migration are. However, there's a separate path to US citizenship that is much more convoluted for folks arriving here in undocumented status. And let's pause a little bit here because we need to differentiate uh, on the meaning of undocumented. There's undocumented folks who arrived without inspection through the border or there are undocumented folks who arrived with a visa to begin with, but then they overstayed. Those are the visa overstays. So throughout my entire presentation, we're gonna be talking about two types of undocumented. Guess what? Um, I'm going to keep referring to Romanian immigrants because that's, uh, that's where a large part of our audience is from. Um, and Amer Romanian immigrants are from both parts of the undocumented spectrum. We have folks who are right through the border and we have uh, visa overstays as well. Um, how does someone who is undocumented evolve towards citizenship, if at all? Sometimes they don't. And that is the left arrow that leads to undetected or no status. And that's where it all ends. They're going to stay undocumented for a long, long time, if not forever throughout their life, um, or 
Some of them get caught in removal proceedings or deportation proceedings during which they defend themselves with filings, defenses or filings such as asylum, 42B cancellation of removal, and a few other relief available in deportation proceedings. And if they are successful in, in convincing an immigration judge that they deserve asylum or cancellation of removal, they evolve to green card or permanent residence. Then there's a third side of undocumented who may have access to temporary remedies available from time to time, such as TPS, temporary protected status. For example, if you were a Ukrainian citizen and uh, you were here in the United States before the full scale invasion of Ukraine, um, and knowing that you cannot go back to Ukraine these days, you can benefit from temporary protected status even if you were here in undocumented status and you were not per se displaced by the war. So that's TPS status. It applies to a lot of other countries, El Salvador, um, Nicaragua, uh, Yemen, Syria, uh, Venezuela, Haiti, uh, Cuba. Uh, I mean, you kind of guessed it. It's it's a lot of the hot spots around the world benefit from TPS in recognition of the fact that these populations cannot easily go back to their country of origin due to either natural calamities, civil wars, or armed conflict, etc. Then there are U visas, which are for victims of, of violent crime, um, or I-601As, which are um, basically pardons for unlawful presence and unlawful employment. And if they, if, through these types of remedies, they could evolve with time towards green card or permanent residence, although there's nothing automatic about it. You just have to keep applying and have to have separate eligibility basis to evolve to a green card. But it is possible. So even the undocumented, some of them may be able with a long time, within a long time to evolve towards a green card. And then after they're a green card holder, just like any other green card holder, they could evolve to citizenship for naturalization in three to five years, depending on whether they're married to a U.S. citizen or they're, uh, they got their green card for employment based. One key message that's going to connect a lot with what my psych, uh, psychologist colleague has to say, licensed, ethical, competent, creative, caring, and well-staffed immigration legal status is essential. Um, a lot of the trauma inflicted on our immigrant population uh, stems from dealing with uh, unscrupulous, unethical, incompetent, um, greedy practitioners out there. Whether they're licensed or whether they're unlicensed, um, unfortunately, our immigrant uh, folks are are victims of these people. So. Um, I'm a, a little bit on a, on a crusade to uh, inform the public that there's a much better options out there. There are people who are all of these things. And where do you find them? There's a special website, avvo.com, where you could check the, on the credibility and the reputation of any legal practitioner in any jurisdiction. Fortunately, even more fortunately, um, it doesn't matter that you cannot find anyone local because fortunately, immigration is federal or national in nature. The same laws apply if you are located in Connecticut is where, where I am as, as you are in, uh, in Chicago, Illinois or any other places around the United States. It's the same immigration law, uh, the same filings, same laws, same forms. Um, Yes, there are some local offices, but most of the filings are adjudicated on a national level. And then perhaps interviews are scheduled locally and that's about it. And even at interviews, they allow legal representation by phone. What does that mean? That's good news for immigrants. You could always find a good competent lawyer, no matter where in the United States situated, 
Uh, you don't have to be limited to the offering that you have in maybe your small state. If you have a small state or you don't have legal talent where you live, perhaps you live in an more in center America and immigration practitioners are not so, you don't find them there. So you could find them anywhere else. You could hire them from Montana to Texas um, and it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, but one thing that I do want to stress is that there's need for these professionals, just given the sheer complexity of immigration laws. And I'm going to keep on going so you, so you see exactly how complex they are. Um, all right. So now, in order to understand what I'm about to present on, you need to understand that our legal immigration system has been deficient for decades, meaning insufficient to match demand with supply of labor. In other words, we need more workers than we have legal visas to provide for them. And that's been the case for decades. So our legislative framework has been lagging behind the times. We are operating in 21st century economy with the legal framework from the 1980s with the same caps on visas as we had in the 1980s. No wonder we have issues at the border. No wonder we have way more, um, there are more folks coming to the United States in response to our demand for labor than we have ability to give them legal visas. And hence, many of them choose to come here unlawfully, unfortunately. Now, without further ado, here are a sample of what some vi visa options may be, may exist for foreign students, professionals, and entrepreneurs. This is just a sampling. The truth is that there are over 26 visa types only in the non-immigrant visa category, and one for each letter of the alphabet. As a matter of fact, for some letters of the alphabet, there are multiple subcategories. Take the H visas, H1, H1 visa, H1B for professional workers, H1B1 for Chileans and Singaporean professional workers, H2B, H2A, H3, H4. You get the point. There's a, and same with E, E1, E2, E3. Um, O1, O1A, O1B, O2, O3, et cetera. So for you to, for anybody outside of the system to understand what is their best option within a complex system with over 26 general visa categories and several subcategories, that is just going to be very difficult and hence the need for some experienced practitioners that could help you sort through your options. And then when we get to the green card level, people think that there's just one green card. Once you get to the green card, that's it. There isn't just one green card type. There's 20 plus different types of green cards for extraordinary ability. Another one for outstanding professors and researchers. Another one for multinational managers or executives. Advanced degrees, professional workers, immigrant investors, uh, religious workers, etc. You get the point. This is also very complex. Um, just a few words about the most common visa types that we keep hearing because we do not have the time to entertain all of them. So real quick, the H-1B visa is the most interesting one. It's for professional workers, meaning people with at least a bachelor's degree in occupations that require at least a bachelor's degree in a specialized occupation. So now the tragedy we're all having is that, like I said, we live in the 21st century economy with a framework from the 1980s. Uh, take a look at this, at what I mean. Since the 1980s, we've only had about 85,000 total available H-1B visas. However, just in April of 2023, 781,000 almost, petitions got filed against the 85,000. So you see there's a huge difference. This year in 2024, there were 487,000, if I remember correctly, um, 
against 85,000, less than last year, only because they try to eliminate duplicate filings by several employers for the same uh, employee. So even with the elimination of duplicates, we have close to half a million of petitions against only 85,000 visas available. You could see it's a national tragedy for two reasons. Number one, employers do not get to hire the labor they actually need. And number two, all these talented professionals are forced to either go back home or figure some other creative avenues to stay and work in the United States. And it gets very complicated. Now, um, real quick, because we have the time to dedicate to finding creative alternatives, we figured out a few creative alternatives around the problem of the H-1B visa lottery. And a lot of it has to do with spaces around universities where companies could open their businesses and hire an unlimited number of H-1B professionals if they work collaboratively, collaboratively with universities. And that's due to a, a feature under federal immigration laws that gives uh, universities special treatment for enabling an unlimited amount of H-1B visas. In Connecticut, we pushed advocacy to such a degree at, be, that we managed to have legislation passed to increase to at least explore increasing the H-1B cap exempt zones in Connecticut so we could facilitate more work visas here. Okay. Um, one central aspect to remember is in the United States, there's protection against discrimination based on national origin, which means employers are only uh, allowed to ask you two legally permitted questions. Are you legally authorized to work in the United States? And will you now or in the future require sponsorship to work for our company? Here's what they're not allowed to ask you, but everybody thinks that you should volunteer it for some reason. No, they're not allowed to ask you, what is your citizenship? Do you have a green card? What type of immigration papers do you have? These are not questions that are legal. However, as as recipients of this treatment, uh, we don't know any better as international students, they might not know any better and they might feel the need to keep volunteering information about their visa status, which in turn leads to them being disqualified from most positions out there. Because when you lead with, do you provide work visa sponsorship, the company may not want to automatically say yes and may want to completely eliminate you from from the race for employment, um, as opposed to just, just answer honestly the questions you're being asked, but do not volunteer more information with the hope that you're gonna be treated equally as anyone else and be given an offer. And then conversations about visa sponsorship could, could enter the field after you've secured an offer. So just a, Piece of wisdom here for international students hearing us. Okay, let's uh, talk about green cards. Um, green cards that are based on employment. So we have a system of preferences. And of course, at the highest pyramid, we prefer people of extraordinary ability, outstanding professors and researchers and multinational executives and managers. And it goes down from there in the order of priority. Um, it is at number three where most of the battle is being given because that's where you are as an international, you're perceived to be at a competition with the U.S. labor force if you're an EB3, which means employment-based third category. If you're an EB3, which means skilled worker, professional, or other workers, but you have nothing in addition to recommend you, like you're not extraordinary ability in anything, you're not a multinational executive or manager, et cetera, then you're simply competing for the same jobs as Americans. And then the analysis there is, well, 
will that employer be unable to locate any willing, able, and uh, ready Americans to take your job? Because if the employer can prove that there's no U.S. citizens uh, ready, willing, and able to take your job, that's when and only when you get your green card. And that is at number three. As you go up from number three at number two, or especially at number one, it's getting easier and easier because at number one, for example, it's so easy for persons of extraordinary ability that it's a self-petition, meaning you don't even need an employer. The minute you can prove that you are extraordinary in sciences, art, education, um, et cetera, or business, that's when you could petition for yourself. You do not need employer sponsorship. So as you could see, you go from, we prefer you with not even an employer uh, to number three, where your employer has to spend a lot of time and money proving to the government that uh, there's no Americans even available to do your job. Okay. Family preference, just a quick note on it. Um, this is the system of preferences for family members. And it starts with immediate relatives of US citizens who are the most preferred spouses, minor children and parents. And it goes down to unmarried sons and daughters of citizens. The, these are adult sons and daughters of citizens and all the way down to brothers and sisters of adult citizens. And I wanna explain to you what those preferences have as a consequence. So this is the chart that we utilize to judge the line that everyone sits in. And because you often hear, no doubt, in the uh, media that, uh, you know, remarks such as, why don't they stay in line? So this is the line. And it goes from uh, preference categories, F1, F2. These are the preferences that you saw in the prior chart from unmarried sons and daughters to F4 brothers and sisters. And look at this. So you could see, for example, that the unmarried um, sons and daughters of US citizens are basically almost nine, nine, almost 10 years. So it takes almost 10 years for unmarried sons and daughters of US citizens to come to the United States, ranging all the way down to F4 siblings. Uh, and right then, right there, they're processing June 2007, which means about 17 years of wait for siblings of U.S. citizens. It gets even worse when you look at countries that uh, that have that send us a lot of immigrants and therefore have country quotas. For example, Mexico. If you are a sibling sibling of a U.S. citizen and you're from Mexico you have to currently wait 24 years because they're processing October 2000. So now you understand why don't they stay in line? So these families are separated by 10 to 15 to 24 years, as you've seen uh, from, from um, coming together. So that is the line. Um, it is available every month via Visa Bulletin. So if you want to know the line as it looks every month, you Google Visa Bulletin. And there's going to be a Department of State website that shows you this line every month. All right. I'm just quickly going to give you a sense of what it takes to legalize the undocumented. I had I had a slide earlier on. But I just wanted to throw a few things out there because the perception is, and if there are undocumented hearing me, your perception is that you're stuck and you can't get out. And I'm here to tell you, don't give up on, on legalization unless you consult with a really good lawyer because there are some creative avenues to break those chains, get you out into legalization. Now, more choices than ever, than I've ever seen in my lifetime. So for example, the forgiveness of your unlawful presence and unlawful employment, if you are, if you came illegally, but you're married to a U.S. citizen or have U.S. citizen parents or permanent resident parents, that's the I-601A. Deferred action for minors, DACA, for all those minors who came here and uh, fulfilled DACA. Now, 
Unfortunately, DACA has been ruled unconstitutional by, by a court and um, new DACAs are not accepted, but existing DACAs are still renewed. And uh, so, but I'm putting it out there just in case we have a resolution to the judicial dispute that led to a temporary declaration of DACA as an unlawful program. It might go the other way, depending on how the, that litigation pans out. Then there's a combination of a non-immigrant visa with a non-immigrant visa waiver that we could do for certain undocumented. There's 245I for people who arrived here before 2000. There's cancellation of removal in uh, deportation proceedings. There's VAWA if you've ever been abused and you are the spouse, child, or parent of a U.S. citizen or of, of a permanent resident. Um, being victim of tr human trafficking or other great crimes would enable you to secure a T or U visa. And a grave crime, for example, for women, hearing me out, domestic violence. Domestic violence is considered a grave crime and would make you eligible for U visa. Okay. Cuban adjustment is a special favor to the Cuban electorate. So anybody who arrives legally in the United States and sets foot on U.S. soil a year later, they get a green card if they're from Cuba. Asylum. Asylum is a big thing. It's, uh, it's right now asylum and it's accompanying convention against torture and withholding of removal are remedies that you can have access to generally within the first year of when you set foot on US, US soil, but there are some exceptions to that one year filing deadline. Include There are even people who declare asylum much later than when they arrived for whatever reasons. And then there's the special immigrant juvenile uh, status for abandoned, neglected, um, abandoned or neglected children. Um, and I would add a military parole in place. Um, I forgot to put it on the chart, but um, recently I've seen I've seen the merits of this program. So I'm going to tell you this: if you if you're undocumented in America and you have U.S. citizen children who are now uh, old enough to register with the armed forces, if U.S. citizen children registered in the armed forces. This could confer parole, military parole in place to their parents, and it could unilaterally legalize them through this program. And so many people react to that by saying, but Dana, my children will get into harm's way being deployed abroad, et cetera. That's not necessarily the case. There's all sorts of programs with the state national guard of whatever state you're in, where the the military jobs look just like the civilian jobs. So there's an accountant position with the National Guard. There's a mechanic, auto mechanic position. There's a helicopter mechanic position that don't regularly get deployed anywhere. They're stationary. And uh, with that, one's family could be legalized. All right. And I have... I have a few tips for how to prepare for immigration reform relief or relief from deportation. Uh, what do I mean by immigration reform? Like I told you, we are in the 21st century act acting with 1980 tools, right? At some point, the legislatures are going to have to do something to fix or update those laws. And that's what we call immigration reform. When when we're going to bring U.S. immigration into the 21st century. Uh, any bill for immigration reform that I've ever seen had the following things in common that want to ask of people who have been here on, in undocumented status. Okay, so maybe you're undocumented, but please don't have any negative interaction with the police. Like, not like driving under the influence or um, any other criminal matters, right? So they want a clean criminal record, um, avoid committing fraud. For example, avoid using someone else's social security number or lying about being a U.S. citizen. Um, 
paying taxes is big. Um, one can pay taxes. Um, I've been told hypocritically so. The IRS will take your money um, under an ITIN, um, individual tax ID number. So even if you're undocumented, you could still uh, pay your taxes. And in fact, every version of immigration reform wants you to be already paying your taxes, even if you're not getting any benefits out of it. Uh, learning English and U.S. civics, it's a big requirement. Uh, establishing good moral character. So to establish good moral character, you have to have uh, witnesses from your community as to your moral character. So doing community service, uh, registering with nonprofits or churches or temples or what what have you, in which where you do community service so people could attest that you've done that in a new version of immigration reform. That would be terrific. Obviously, save money because everything costs. When a immigration reform comes around, the government is going to charge you application fees. They might even charge you a penalty for the illegal presence. And that is just going to cost. And also, lawyers will charge you to prepare the paperwork. And with that, I'm going to uh, finalize my presentation, telling you that we work very closely with our Lex Mundi affiliates around the world in 100 countries, including Romania, just in case there are issues of local law, like foreign, uh, current, foreign country expertise, currency control, sources of funds, et cetera. So thank you so much for your attention. And I look forward to interacting with my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues in other fields that have to do with the experience of immigration. Um, because I have a lot to say to you about the other aspects of immigrating when it comes to victims of crimes, when it comes to asylee, refugees, uh, victims of domestic violence, et cetera. Thank you. Dana, thank you so very much. I'm going to ask you to make me host again uh, so I can um, allow the other presenters to share and as you do that, I just wanted to say, uh, you are amazing. We love you so much. We love your breadth of knowledge. We love your advocacy. We love your passion um, and support for everything we do. And thank you so much for being here. I am ready to turn this over to Mihaela Campion, who is also president of Archer. Mihaela, please tell us a little bit more about who you are and please take it over and tell us why the topic of immigration is important to you as a psychologist. Um, thank you. Thank you, Roxana, and thank you everyone uh, for attending this um, um, event. Uh, we really appreciate your presence and interest in what we do at Archer. Um, so in addition to Archer, which is fairly young, I think it's in the age of a toddler at the moment, um, I have been um, probably my entire career, you know, in, in the United States is revolving around being a clinical psychotherapist. Um, I started in 97 after going to school here. Uh, I came in 1990 and I'm an asylee myself after being part of the revolution in Romania. Um, and um, I um, started my um, career as a clinician working in different organization, nonprofit organization in Chicago. Uh, with refugees and immigrants. I still volunteer for some, and I'm still sharing my expertise in the field of immigration because of the, um, of the many years of working with refugees in the Chicago communities. Um, in 2001, I started my private practice, and I'm still um, doing, you know, private uh, um, psychotherapy sessions, and I can say that probably six, anywhere between 30 and 50 percent of the population I continue to serve is of immigrant, uh, is the immigrant population, mainly from Eastern Europe, but also from Africa, uh, South America, and um, uh, some of the Middle Eastern uh, um, immigrants. 
Um, why it's so dear to me? First of all, because I'm an immigrant myself and I feel for everybody who goes through the experience of uprooting and uh, finding new roots and finding meaning to life. And uh, I, I've been exposed and um, uh, witnessed the difficulties that some experience in the process of um, immigration. So I would like to say a few words and insist a little bit more on the undocumented immigrants because I think they suffer the most when it comes to mental health issues and also physical issues. Uh, not to minimize the experience of all immigrants because I understand the difficulties, the separation, uh, the adjustment, finding new ways to live your life, to reconnect, to be part of a community, uh, to feel for our country of origin, which is still part of who we are, even though we are um, Americans now. Uh, but the the burden, the um, extra burden that undocumented immigrants suffer is is, you know, undescribable sometimes. So what are the mental health risk factors when it comes to undocumented immigrants? So we have trauma and stressor stressors before, during, and after immigration. So a few, I think Dana already mentioned a lot of this in her presentation. And briefly, I can say like before, um, we deal with, with people who escape from violence, poverty, political oppression, threats, or disasters. During the immigration process, they are still possibly exposed to violence, environmental hazards, abandonment, separation from family of origin, um, even witnessing death. And after um, uh, the immigration, they, they um, still have limited resources given their status. I mean, being undocumented, it's clearly uh, depriving them of, um, of resources. Um, so, and also the stress from adjusting to the new environment. Uh, being exposed to more exploitation than those who have legal status, and also the fear of deportation, which is huge. I've seen this a lot in the work I do with people who don't have legal status in the United States. Uh, another factor is re racism and discrimination. Uh, this is a whole topic that we can really spend probably hours on. Uh, but just a few things, you know, like overt and subtle acts of racism and discrimination that mainly those who are undocumented may suffer, uh, being poorly treated at work or in schools. Um, and there is also the phenomenon of triple discrimination, as it's called, which is very specific to immigrants and primarily to women. Um, who face um, an increased risk for triple discrimination. Uh, they are discriminated against because they are unprotected workers, they are discriminated against because they are women, and they are discriminated against because of their unstable immigration status in the destination country, respectively in the United States. Uh, another uh, form of racism and discrimination is racial profiling, um, implicit, explicit bias and, and microaggressions, um, treatment in school and the workplace, um, institutional racism, of course, um, that, you know, uh, mainly the undocumented immigrants are exposed to. Another factor is fear and distrust. It's very common for especially undocumented immigrants to distrust of the US legal system. It can be very much related to what Dana already mentioned that, uh, you know, the long waiting, uh, the unavailability of, um, you know, um, employers to process uh, um, applications. 
but definitely studies show that undocumented immigrants have increased rates of fear and distrust of the US legal system, and that caused a decreased participation in civic life, including advocacy efforts. And I think that's very important to understand why sometimes communities um, fear and um, shy away from, uh, from advocacy. Uh, and the big one in fear and distrust is related to fear of deportation. And especially now, given the current political climate, undocumented immigrants live in widespread fear of deportation, which limits their use of services, including health, mental health, and social services. And also it prevents the social integration. Um, we use terms, and I think I would like to clarify a little bit on the terms that you probably heard me saying, things or Dana mentioned also related to psychological trauma. And I just want to mention that, you know, traumatic events are part of life. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone who is exposed or suffers uh, psychological um, suffers traumatic events will also present the full um, diagnose um, symptoms for PTSD. Um, so we use trauma without necessarily considering that a person is, you know, presenting the diagnosis for post-traumatic stress disorder. But it's important to understand that um, many of the immigrants, and especially those who are undocumented, suffer psychological trauma because of not having legal status in the United States. So what is psychological trauma? Is damage to a person's mind as a result of one or more distressing events causing overwhelming amounts of stress that exceed a person's ability to cope or integrate the emotions involved eventually leading to serious long-term negative consequences on mental health. So it is important to understand that, and it's important to uh, get the full history, especially for those who work clinically with, uh, with immigrants, of what people have been through in order to be able to find the right treatment for them. Um, Post-traumatic stress disor disorder can develop in anyone after experiencing or witnessing a major life-threatening event. Um, a major life-threatening event can include domestic abuse, as Dana mentioned that, yes, um, VAWA uh, applicants can prove um, in, in their application, and this is one of my specialties, um, working with uh, domestic abuse, because it does expose the victim to extremes of fear and, um, you know, can lead to depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder as well. Now, studies show that living with domestic violence can cause physical and emotional harm to children and young people as well um, in several ways, like ongoing anxiety and depression, emotional distress, eating, sleeping disturbances, substance abuse, and alcoholism later on in life. Uh, domestic violence is also a major contributor to the health of women, ill health of women, because it has uh, very serious consequences on women's mental and physical health, including their reproductive and sexual health. Um, I have a, a short vignette, a clinical vignette to present, um, and uh, I hope you'll have some questions afterwards. So this is Tiera, 16 years old. Uh, she's undocumented, an undocumented Guatemalan American with no previous psychiatric or psychological history, mental health history. Uh, she was sent to the school mental health clinic by her 10th grade teachers for a marked change in behaviors. 
uh, while previously she was an honor student looking forward to attend college, at the moment she reports that her grades have recently dropped due to constant stress, in her own words. In addition to schoolwork, Tierra was previously involved in extracurricular activities and part-time summer employment to support her family. When probed about her future, she feels that college is no longer an option because of the uncertainty surrounding the DACA program and um, because of her family situation, the uncertainties in her family. Constant worries about deportation have made everyday activities like attending school or shopping for groceries, groceries challenging and um, fear-ridden for her and for her family. The fear is greatly compounded for Tiara, uh, Tiara, as the U.S. is the only country she has known. She has not been back to Guatemala since age three. Given the current sociopolitical climate, she has become progressively depressed, outwardly irritable, and withdrawn. She reports hopelessness, poor appetite, night and nightmares of deportation. Her parents are also struggling. They have lost their jobs because of their respective employers' concerns about their immigration status. While they have found odd jobs to make ends meet, the overall financial stress level in the home is very high. This has led to strained family dynamics, dynamics including nightly verbal arguments between her parents who are also experiencing their own severe stress and psychological symptoms. And the um, lack of availability and trust to seek treatment is very, very common, especially for undocumented uh, immigrants. Um, I also have a list of treatment recommendations, but I'm going to leave this at the end for questions and um, if it's going to be anything related to that or any interest in finding out more what can be done. Um, but I definitely uh, support what Dana said earlier, the idea of being involved in communities, seeking support, uh, avoiding isolation, which is very common and very um, uh, dangerous at the same time. Um, and um, yeah, ask for help and look and not give up because there is always a possibility to uh, legalize the status. Thank you, Mihaela, for, for your presentation. Indeed, Mihaela and I connect uh, very much uh, in the psychological uh, visa category, so to speak. Uh, one of the issues that I have to document for anybody who's been uh, in undocumented status in the United States, when we have to prove exceptional hardship to a U.S. citizen or permanent resident relative, like spouse or parent, I need a psychologist to sit down with that U.S. citizen or permanent resident relative and go through their emotional and psychological needs to document why the deportation of the immigrant would lead to um, extremely unusual hardship for for the U.S. citizen. Um, but one, one thing that I wanted to highlight here is the focus is on the U.S. citizen, not the immigrant. Um, and one of the underlying policies of our entire immigration system, let's remember, is not as much benefiting immigrants as much as benefiting their U.S. citizen relatives or U.S employers. And once we get that about our immigration system, we understand the legal options much better. There's, there's very rarely an option that would give an immigrant a self-petition towards status. That is only available in the humanitarian categories or, the in, in, or in the extraordinary categories. Other than that, immigrants depend very much on how strong of a connection they make to the U.S. citizen community around them 
and to the U.S. employer who would petition for them. Our next speaker is Juana Amaria, and I would love to ask her to introduce herself to our uh, audience members and to also expand a little bit about her uh, encounter with immigration and her passion for uh, advocacy and support. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, it's very rare for me to be on a session where someone knows how to say my name. So thank you for that. It's a, a great, <laughs> a great uh, way to get started. And so um, my name is Juan. I'm the founder and practice leader at Firefly. And um, it's really interesting when we think about just the stories that were shared from Donna and the immigration component to um, just understanding Mihaela and, and the context of how we cope with change. Um, I've been in the field of DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, for the past 20 years, and it actually started in the cross-cultural space. So when you think about organizational development and how people work with multinational employees, right, that was the root of it in the context of the workplace. And since then, um, you know, there's been this evolution of the neuroscience in the context of what does it mean to work equitably across difference, um, which is where I do my work and I work with global organizations. But a big part of my interest in why I'm here in this space is I um, am also an, uh, a refugee. And so that is a big part of my story. And when uh, I think it was you, Roxana, talking about trauma, trauma could be big T, but it could also be little T, right? So tra so your, your experiences could be very formative to you in ways that isn't always as obvious, right? So my family fled Romania as part of, um, it was like the last window before the revolution. We actually left in September of 89 and the revolution was in December. If you could imagine, my father had fled two years before and it was a very formative experience for me. And, um, you know, I watched my family struggle to adjust to a culture that they didn't understand how to navigate. You know, so when Mihaela talks about the fear and distrust, I think a big part of the fear and distrust is also not knowing this new system. And if I don't know, I'm going to latch on to conspiracies or I'm going to latch on to my community for help and navigation. Um, so I was this little kid that grew up in Chicago. So that's how um, I got connected with this group. And, um, you know, I'll share a little bit about my story as I go through some of this content. but. Um, you know, I think that the biggest gift we can give to the people that we support, and I know that um, a few of our folks have left, but it's to give them a sense that there is actually hope. You know, when you think about um, there are technical things that you have to do via, you know, people like Donna, there are things that you can reach out and get support from from Mihaela to really figure out how do I put myself in the place to to, to be the best possible version of me, but there are also tools to learn to adapt, which I think is really important and really powerful. Perfect. Um, so one of the things that, you know, I think oftentimes we think about culture is, um, you know, how do we, how do we tolerate each other? Historically, at least that was the, the case in organizations and, um, with companies, right? And we've moved to this place of cultural competence. And, um, you know, the when we think about cultural competence, it really, it really isn't, I think oftentimes people feel like, oh, I'm gonna lose my own heritage or I'm gonna lose my own culture or how do I stick with my own community? And that's not necessarily always the case. And if you go, uh, Roxana, to slide four, the, there, there is a continuum that we often use, especially in, in the context of um, how do we adapt with something different than ourselves? This is called the intercultural development continuum. And we move in this, um, it's on this spectrum of change. And I just wanna share a quick story about myself and when we think about culture, um, how this works, right? So oftentimes there are these different stages within the way that we navigate difference and and we start in a place that is monocultural meaning it's the only thing i know it's only my culture right 
And the story I always tell people is, you know, when I was, um, so I, I arrived in Chicago in September of 1989, I was in second grade. And you don't know you have a culture, right? It's like fish and water until you're, you meet something completely different than yourself. Well, little second grade Juana um, experienced Halloween for the first time ever in America, if you could imagine, right? So when we think about, you know, where we start as a, as a human being and what we know, we don't know we have a culture. We just think this is the way that it is. It's in, we're in the water, right? And as you move through something that is a completely different shock to your system, like immigrating to a different country, it doesn't matter which version of the status you're in, right? But, but imagine the, the most um, simple version of that, right? You're not going through trauma, you're not going through violence, you're not going through this post-war, right? You get to a place and you're unaware of your differences. And then you move to a place where now all of a sudden you have two different cultures that you're comparing, right? And you think about the culture that you know and the culture that you don't and what happens in these communities and this is very common in the in the romanian bubble in in chicago or in la or um you know pick a place um is you start to to judge the culture that you know best with the culture that you have less nuance on right so think about um, you know, oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, if they only knew the, the reason why we, oh, well, we, don't, we don't do this back home, we do it like this, right? And it, it, it's a place where you have a lot of different beliefs and values that are built into the way that we view the world and adapt to the world. And so it's, it's fascinating because this happens in the workplace as well, right? You have mergers that happen, you have different teams that get connected. And so oftentimes, you know, um, when we teach people to deal with difference or when we te teach people to deal with conflict, one of the things that we talk about is to listen for that us and them language, right? Because when you have that us and them language, you're seeing it in a very binary way. And life is not binary, right? There's a lot of different shades of gray. And, um, you know, one of the important things to think about when we think about this stage of polarization is the fact that, um, there's two things that happen. Either you defend the culture that you know, or you also can do reversal. And the reversal is you give the other culture, you put them on a pedestal. So think about the last time you went on vacation to to Italy, to Venice, or to, you know, I, I um, spent my 22nd year on this planet in Ghana, which was the first place that I've ever lived outside of the U.S., and I put them on a pedestal. It's like, oh, the Ghanaians are so this. And, you know, I was romanticizing my experience with this very... Um, limited experience I had in a culture. And so, as you can imagine, we move through this continuum. And the only thing that I would say to anyone, this is an assessment you can take, by the way. So for those of you that are watching um, or want, you know, more tools and insights, um, it's actually something that plots you and there's no right or wrong place to be. I think that's the thing that I would stay with with folks to say, you know, that um, we have very different lived experiences and it's not so much the experience that matters it's how we adapt and react to that experience and this is i think something mihaela will pull through you know in in a lot of the conversations that she has but the idea is to be able to have access to different ways of approaching difference right so if we're always going to think about it from this binary place it's going to be very challenging because all you're doing is comparing um, moving from polarization to minimization is actually um, a very natural place to go. Think of what you do at parties. You get together and you try to figure out, well, what do I have in common with people, right? And you find your favorite show. You find your favorite team. You talk about what happened to your kids, right? We talk about your puppies and, and all the different um, components, right? And the idea is to figure out how do we connect you know, and build community, but not just build community with the people that look and sound and act like us. And then once you've learned to connect, how do we start to notice the differences in a way that benefit us and make us better and challenge us to be stronger and better and smarter human beings, which again is not always the simplest thing to, to really think about. So, um, you know, one of the things that we often talk about, um, you know, in a lot of these things is we talk about values. And so if you want to go to slide six really quick, uh, Roxana, um, and I, I won't go through all of these different components, but, um, you know, values are very tricky um, because 
you know, we can all, if I went around the room and I asked people, you know, we have common values as the word. It's the meaning behind the values that are always going to be very different, right? And so we always use this iceberg analogy, right? Because you see the behaviors, you don't see the values. You don't see the thoughts, you don't see the feelings. Um, and I have a couple of different examples. That I, again, I use the Romanian uh, context here, but this idea of ce șapte ani de acasă, right? This common sense. Well, you have to be well raised, right? Um, um, this idea of soulfulness, right? To să pui suflet, to put your heart and soul into something, right? These are all things that collectively, as a as a people, we have been trained and rewarded to behave. Now take this and and plug it into an individualistic culture, which is the U.S. Right? Take this and plug you know this idea of creative problem solving, being resourceful, right? And plug it into a place that is is highly individualistic, right? It becomes a very very challenging thing to do. And one of the things that that I learned, you know, later on in my life through my practice and through my work, is that there are actually dimensions of culture and difference that you have to learn to recognize and to have language for to be able to navigate. And so when we think about taking someone, whether it's the the profile that Mihaela read, or if you think of your friends and the people in your family, you know, and you you now try to plug them into the workplace. You now try to figure out, you know, how are they going to navigate their new team? They're navigating their new uh, boss, right? If you come from a Romanian or Eastern European culture, hierarchy is a very big thing. That is not necessarily the case in US cultures, right? And, and global organizations. So how do we get to build some awareness around some of these pieces? I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just wanted to show um, one example. If you can go to uh, Roxana to slide 13, um, and I'll give you all this slide. Um, yeah. Um, this is called the, the cultural dimensions. If you're familiar with Hofstadt's work and Hall's, um, it gives us language for behaviors, right? So that instead of showing up with judgment, so and so is just being you know, lazy or so and so is not being honest with me or so and so didn't respond, you know, we can we can say, you know, people are being explicit or implicit, right, we can give language to describe behavior in a very different way. And what I've done here is I've, um, you know, established a couple of different differences on where the US as a national archetypical culture plugs away at and connects with in the context of comparing to, to Romania, right? So when we think about dimensions of difference, I would say the biggest thing to think about is context. Context is always king. So we're gonna be lots of different things in different scenarios. So this is not gospel. Don't run with this. Don't find your next Romanian friend and, <laughs> and assume, because I can promise you I'll be the first Romanian not to fit on any of these things. Um, you know, but this is a good place to think about you know, collective cultures um, as a whole, a collective identity. So, um, Roxana, if we move through this, the idea is that there are four dimensions. So it's how we um, interact with people, how we regulate and control the world. I actually find this really fascinating with um, Romanian culture. Romanians are very external control culture people, meaning, um, you know, there was so much change and uncertainty within the context of the Romanian experience that that you're you're waiting for God to help or for uh, a spirituality or for something to change. There's a lot of superstition, for example, right? As compared to internal locus of control, um, I can rely on myself. I can rely on my resources. I can rely on my network. I can rely on my internet. You know, all these different components that are really quite fascinating to think about. Um, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of different dimensions that, um, you know, we can build awareness around to figure out how to navigate. One of the questions that Roxana asked is, you know, the, the context around, you know, what tips do you share? And Roxana, um, there are lots of resources at the back of this, the last couple of slides. If anyone is interested, um, there's all these dimensions that we have plotted, but if anybody's interested in really kind of figuring out, you know, I'm having a hard time um, and I think um, if I understood correctly, some of our participants on this chat as well, you know, have a lot of expertise in, you know, navigating some of these differences, right? 
But the idea is that there are lots of organizations out there for immigrants. That's a good one, uh, Roxana, the, the penultimate, that one, yeah. You know, the idea is to start thinking about, you know, where am I on this continuum? Where is the organization or where am I struggling? And then the very next slide is really this context of where am I over indexed? Because the idea is not to be all of these things all the time, but can I, can I be indirect? You know, can I switch my behaviors to be, to optimize the way that I show up with my neighbors, with my community members, with my boss, with my team? And so there's lots of different resources to take. And there's also lots of organizations out there. So for example, Upwardly Global is a really great resource that I'm sure everyone is familiar with that um, I've supported over the years and I'm a huge fan of, um, you know, to be able to start transitioning people like my parents who came here and um, were engineers in Romania, had to pick up different jobs, just like every other immigrant story. And how do you give people the confidence and the encouragement to be able to really attach to some of those different developmental requirements to grow. So I'll leave it at that. And maybe we can open it up for questions as we close out. All right, thank you so much, Juana. This is, uh, it's been really amazing. I think that, um, I need an entire day to listen to you. This has been fantastic. Uh, what a great resource. Thank you, Mihaela, for suggesting Juana. Thank you, uh, our panelists. I really would love to open this up for questions from our guests. Um, I would like to, uh, you know, restrict myself um, as I admit more people from the waiting room. So please take it over, unmute yourself or, Type your question in the chat. But as you're thinking about your questions, I do want to get us started perhaps and, um, and have uh, our participants, our, our presenters today, um, Tell us a little bit how legal professionals, mental health experts, and cultural consultants can work together to support immigrants holistically. How do you envision partnerships between these three areas? Well, this uh, webinar is the first step in that direction. Uh, in fact, it's the second step because I remember a while ago, Mihaela and I had a similar webinar on the intersection uh, between immigration and psychology. Um, and we discovered quite the common ground there. So I would imagine that similar webinars uh, that are being offered to communities um, would be invaluable. And the goal here is to make our communities Romanian communities more comfortable with these professionals, right? Because um, there's a fear coming to legal professionals to begin with. And I can tell why I have, I cannot tell you how many times I've taken cases where the life of the individual has been destroyed by prior unethical licensed or unlicensed practitioners who just mm -hmm. don't care. Um, you know, they want the money. Sometimes they don't even do any services. Sometimes their services lead to the deportation of the immigrant. So the trust in the legal profession, in the Im immigrant legal, in the immigration legal professional is very low in our communities. And I'm here to keep talking about the absolutely crucial role that a good, competent, licensed immigration lawyer has in making sure that everybody stays here legally and to the extent you fell off the wagon for whatever reasons, that you have the adequate resources to put your life back on track. And that is my message. And there's no excuse these days because there's websites out there that will help you research the reputation of any legal professional. Uh, additionally, it is good to keep uh, in touch with uh, professionals like Juana and Mihaela because I like to refer folks to them whenever whenever the need arises. Uh, unfortunately, 
I am not sure Mihaela will tell you more about her jurisdictional limits. Um, I don't have any because my law is federal in nature, but uh, for psychologists and uh, medical professionals, they're more restricted on state boundaries. Uh, but we could talk about that. Um, and Juana, I'm sure you have no state borders to what you have to offer, which is absolutely applicable to um, nationwide. Um, and so I am more than open to collaborate with these professionals and keep doing these awareness raising webinars um, and get the word out to our communities. I, I personally think it's like a Venn diagram, you know, um, I think oftentimes people think of what Dana or Mihaela do as this black box. And I think it's similar for us. So I work with organizations. I don't necessarily um, have the capacity to do like one on one stuff anymore. But this idea that I think back to building trust and giving hope, if you think it's a black box and you can't understand it and you can't navigate it, you're not going to try. And so for me, my personal interest in having this conversation is just to say it's not a black box you can learn this and you could build the antennas to navigate and to read the room and to to interact in a way that will help you be more successful right and i think that's the part that is um is always challenging for people especially at work because it becomes a very like oh no you know um i can say it in romanian right so it becomes this very like what do i do if i can't figure it out what do i do if i can't read the context right because a lot of what we do is informal and it's it's indirect right and and it's you know we talked about microaggressions before and the challenges of my there's also micro behaviors that are the 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 minimal <laughs> interactions in the workplace right to get you the promotion to get you the boss to get you all the other components right so um I think it's hard. It's hard. And the more that we can create awareness around what is available and how we can grow together, I think the better. I absolutely loved everything I heard here today. Um, and um, I'm passionate about cultures. And I, I really, it really uh, touched me when you said, Wana, to. Um, work with our own mindset of looking at us and them mm -hmm. uh, because that's you know uh, it's the barrier in itself so the more we understand our own culture the more we can understand other cultures as well and communicate accordingly um, one thing that I always recommend especially among colleagues is to examine our implicit bias. You know, when it comes to other cultures, I think it's very important to recognize what's in us and not deny it because that's the only way to improve and to work it through. Um, when it comes to the clients that I work with, um, I don't shy away from uh, informing them about their rights. So when there is, you know, someone who is struggling with immigration status or struggling with uh, employment or, any, you know, or domestic violence or any form of abuse, um, I let them know that they are not alone in this and there are a lot of resources that they can use. And I think the more resources we can get together as organizations, as individuals who are passionate about the work we do, I think the more uh, we can help others. Um, I think it's very important even in our daily life or professional life to use what we call in, ther in therapy, the narrative therapy, which is pretty much letting everyone tell the story. Uh, we all want to be heard. We all want to have a story, to share our own story. So the more people who uh, feel, you know, the burden of not, you know, of immigration in general, the more they can, they have a safe space to tell their own story, they, they feel empowered and they can learn more and move forward um, in life. 
I want to say one more word on our collaboration, which is absolutely necessary. These are the disciplines that are at the basis of advocacy. So if we are to do advocacy for immigrants in general and Romanian immigrants in specifically, we need these disciplines to collaborate with points that assist the immigrants. I'll give you an example of what I mean. In Connecticut, we changed the three laws uh, with the state at the state level to benefit the Romanian American community. And one of the laws was to introduce the Romanian language as one of the languages in which you could take the driving license test, which is huge because you have Romanians who are here on day one and they need to eat, therefore they need to work, therefore they need to drive, but on day one through day 90, let's say their English is not that good. Um, and But what does that mean, that they shouldn't be able to drive and work? Um, well, not if Romanian is one of the languages at the DMV uh, for a driving test. However, there's resistance. Every time you introduce or you try to push this type of legislation at the state level, there's resistance from the side of, of the mainstream culture. And we've seen, we've seen um, Juana present us a chart and she interestingly said that there's no wrong way, no wrong uh, place to be. I kindly disagreed. <laughs> I respectfully disagree with her. There was one place that she said where people are ignorant of cultural differences. I think that's the wrong place to be because that that will negatively affect our chances of introducing something like Romanian language in the DMV system because um, if the um, if Americans do not um, understand how this works and how maybe immigrants won't be able to speak English on day one, it takes a while to onboard into and to integrate into the American society. If they don't understand that point, they're not going to be supportive of our legislation. So it is our job to advocate and explain to the American public why it is also in their best interest to assist immigrants to integrate into the workforce. What is the alternative? They stay home on public benefits or worse? No, that's not a healthy alternative for any any. Um, uh, society. And uh, what they usually say in America is, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. That's what they say in America. Uh, unfortunately, immigrants way too often are not at the table. Okay, so let's contemplate about that. We're not at the table, politically speaking. Um, so those of us who could be at the table, we owe it to these communities to bring their perspective to the table so they don't become, they don't convert themselves to being on the menu, right? So for example, if you have a voice, state why Romanian is essential that Romanian and other languages are introduced at the DMV, etc., and all sorts of other initiatives that would benefit our communities. So a lack of power or representation is an issue with immigrants. And disciplines such as law, psychology, cultural sociology um, are very well needed in advocacy for these immigrants. Well, thank you very much to our presenters. We have now arrived at the conclusion of our webinar today. We would love to spend a lot more time to unpack these very complex issues. Uh, hopefully we can reconvene for a part two. Um, uh, if we garner enough interest, please let us know in your comments uh, and show us your love and support on social media. But before we part and before we say one final thank you uh, to our speakers today, let us leave you with some um, organizations uh, for further support where you can seek legal support, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, Immigrant Legal Resource Center, Catholic Legal Immigration Network Incorporated. Donna, if you have uh, any other suggestions, please put them in the chat for us. For mental health support, we have the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services, or ISIS, Mental Health America, 
Resources for Immigrants and Refugees, and National Alliance on Mental Illness. And for cultural integration programs, one I mentioned Upwardly Global. There's also Welcoming America and the International Rescue Committee. And with this, oh, uh, Dana put in the chat something we also noticed on her slide, avvo.com. Thank you for that. With this, we have come to the conclusion. We wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. And we'll talk to you soon.